So this morning, I want to talk to you very quickly about four practical principles for finding God's divine direction for your life. I had to make that rhyme a little bit with a lot of Ds. Really what it's saying, how do you know God's will for your life? How do you know when God is supernatural leading us? Or is our life just case hurrah? Whatever will be, will be. They offered me more money, so I'm just going to go do it. This job came available, so I'm just going to do it. I met her, and she's the prettiest one I met, so I'm just going to marry her. You know, I, how do we know that God is supernaturally leading us in life? And does he want to lead us in life? And let me tell you, he does want to supernaturally lead you. Romans chapter 8, verse number 14. Romans chapter 8. Notice what the Apostle Paul says. He says, as many as are led. Everybody say led. led. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So here he's literally telling us that the Holy Spirit wants to lead us. In fact, it's a characteristic of children of God, of believers, of Christians, of people who are born again. A characteristic is to be led by God. We do not live life, K Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see, K Sarah. We don't live life that just whatever happens, happens, and we have no control of it, or we have no uh, choice in the matter. That's not the way Christians should live. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. In fact, let me give you some scriptures just to back that up. Turn with me real quickly to Psalm chapter 37. I hope you brought your Bibles. Psalm chapter 37, verse number 23. Notice what Psalm 37, 23 says. It says, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. The Lord directs. One translation says, the Lord orders the steps of the godly. And then it says, he delights in every detail of our life. He delights. See, a lot of people think my, my relationship, my involvement with Jesus is only when I get saved. Only when conviction comes upon me in a church service or sometime at home or when somebody is talking to me, conviction comes upon me and I realize I need Jesus and I ask Jesus to come in my heart. I pray a prayer and become his son and his daughter and I get baptized in water and that's about it. From then on, I'm on my own. God's really not concerned about me, and he's really not involved in my life. Can I tell you, nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible says here in Psalm 37, 23, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of your life. Here's one we all know, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the thoughts, I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord. I know the plans. So God's got a plan. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Here's another one, Psalm 73, verse 24. I love this one. You guide me. Notice he guides us. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to a glorious destiny. See, the Lord has a plan. He wants to direct our steps. He yes, he gets us saved. He, he changes us. We're born again. We have an encounter with him at that moment. But he also wants to be with us and lead us every step of our life and bring us to, the Bible says, a glorious destiny. And then this one, John chapter 16, verse number 13. John 16, when the spirit of truth comes, that's the Holy Spirit, he will guide you. He'll guide you. Into all truth, he will not speak of his own, but will tell you what he's heard. He will tell you about the future. What's going to happen, Pastor? What's going to happen next? All this crazy stuff going on in our world today. What's going to happen? What's going to happen for our children? What's going to happen for our grandchildren? What's going to happen in our nation? The Bible says the Lord doesn't want his children to be caught off guard. He will guide us. He will tell us about our future. So from these verses of scriptures, and there's dozens of others, but from these verses of scriptures, we, lead, we read that God has a plan for your life. God desires to order and lead you in your steps so you can fulfill that plan. And God desires to lead us in every season of our life so we can follow that plan. And many of us read those verses and we see that's wonderful and that's great, but we struggle 
finding the plan and purpose of God for our life. We know something on the inside says, I know I'm here for a purpose. I know I'm here for a bigger purpose than I'm fulfilling. I know God put me on this earth for a destiny. Something inside of me tells me that. But I just don't know how to find it. And I don't know what it is. So this morning, I want to talk to you about practical ways to discover God's supernatural leading. God's practical way, just practical ways to discover God's supernatural leading. And the way I learned these things is by studying the life of Paul, the Apostle Paul. How many of you have heard of the Apostle Paul? He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. In Acts chapter 15 and Acts chapter 16, Paul starts his second missionary journey. Acts chapter 15, Acts chapter 16, Paul talks, starts his second missionary journey. He had two major mission trips. And in his second one, he did amazing things. Paul and Silas, his partner Silas, they did amazing things. You can read about it in the book of Acts. In, in his second missionary journey, he started the church at Thessalonica, where we get the letter in the New Testament to the Thessalonians. He started the church at Berea. He started the church at Athens, Greece. He started the church of Ephesus, where we get the Bible book Ephesians. He started the church at Corinth, where we get the two books, First and Second Corinthians. All those happened during his second missions trip. And not only did he start those churches, he also launched ministers into ministry. He, st he helped uh, Priscilla, uh, a female preacher, a, pr uh, a female preacher back then. Some people struggle with female preachers today. Paul didn't struggle with a female preacher. He didn't struggle with it. He, he launched Priscilla, her husband, Aquila. He launched Timothy, who we know about. All of those guys and girls got started in their ministry in Paul's second missionary journey. In this same missionary journey where all these churches were established and all these preachers got started... He experienced divine healings. People got healed by the power of God. People who had demons, the demons got cast out in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, entire cities got saved and turned to the Lord Jesus Christ during his second missionary journey. And 2,000 years later, in Cook, Vegas, Tennessee, the city that never sleeps, we still remember Paul's second missionary journey, the amazing, spectacular things he did. But it didn't start out amazing. His journey didn't start out amazing. In fact, it started out everything other than amazing. Let me show you what I mean. And this is literally what I mean. First principle, how the Lord leads you one time is not necessarily the way the Lord will need you, lead you the next time. Let me repeat that. If you want to find God's will for your life, how he leads you the first time might not be the way he leads you the second time. I talk to a lot of people every single week, and they'll say, what do you think the Lord wants me to do? What do you think? I remember years ago when I had to make a big decision, this is the way it happens. Well, and they're looking for it to happen the same way this time, to find God's will. The way God leads you one time might not be the way God leads you the second time. Let me prove it to you. In Acts chapter 13, now I just told you about his second missionary journey in Acts 15, 16. In Acts 13, Paul launches in his first missionary journey. Turn with me to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Notice what it says. Now, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, also called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Notice Saul is listed with this group of ministers. Verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work where I've called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them out. So first of all, notice something's going on here. Paul's with a bunch of other ministers and they're in a prayer meeting. 
Notice they're not in a committee meeting. They're in a prayer meeting. Sometimes the will and plan of God for your life is not found in the good deliberations of others. It's found in your prayer closet, God speaking directly to you. Paul is in a prayer meeting. And during this prayer meeting, it says as they ministered to the Lord. What does that mean, they ministered to the Lord? They just spend time worshiping. They just spend time praising him. They just spend time telling him personally how wonderful you are. I don't know about your prayer time, but all of my prayer time, my daily prayer time, I don't begin by asking God for things. I don't begin by talking about my problems. I begin my prayer time every time with the Lord talking about how big he is, about how good he is, and about his attributes. attributes. Oh, Lord, you're so wonderful. You're so long-suffering. You're so great. You're so kind. You're so fair. You're omnipotent. There's none like you, and I give you praise. You are the only true God. I'm going to tell you, if your prayer time, if you'll start out bragging on God, it'll change the whole temperature of your prayer moment. And the Bible says, as they ministered to the Lord, the Holy Ghost said, the Holy Spirit said. In other words, they're having a prayer meeting, and suddenly a supernatural moment occurs where the Spirit of God speaks and says, I want Paul and Silas to leave here and go start ministry. Leave here and go start ministry. Now, here's something that it doesn't say, but it's truth nonetheless. It says, I want them to leave here and go start the ministry where I've called them. In other words, Paul, God had already called Paul to ministry, but Paul hadn't started out yet. He knew there was something in his heart that he was supposed to do, but he hadn't done it yet. Do you know where God called Paul, when God called Paul into ministry? He called him in Acts chapter 9. He called him in Acts chapter 9. But God didn't release him and send him out to Acts 13. Do you know how many years occur between Acts 9 and Acts 13? Well, it's four chapters, probably four days. No, it's 10 years. Between Acts 9 and Acts 13, it's 10 years. Now, listen to me. Some of you, you've known for years there's something in you that God wants you to do. Paul knew it. He had already been called in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus. When he saw the light from heaven, God says, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. But God never sent him for 10 years until we get to Acts chapter 13. And the Spirit of God supernaturally says, supernaturally says, it's time for you to go. Ten years lasted. Paul's been sitting on this stirring for ten years. He's had this thing stirring in him, knowing I was born for more than this. I was born to do this. I was born, but the doors hadn't opened. Things hadn't happened. I'm not sure it's the time to go, but I know, I'm, I'm, I know there's something God wants me to do. There's some of you here today and watching me on our other campuses. You know your purpose for being in here on earth is greater than what you're doing right now. You've got a stirring, and you might have been sitting on it for years. And understand the time between the Acts 9 when he was called and when he was separated, that time, that 10 years is not dead time. You don't need to allow it be dead time. That's the preparation time. That's preparation. So Paul is supernaturally called into ministry. He's supernaturally called, and we read about. That's his first missionary journey. But remember, the way God leads you one time is not necessarily the way God will lead you the second time because then we find out that, let's go back to Acts chapter, uh, uh, Acts chapter, let me find it, 15. Acts chapter 15. That's Paul's first missionary journey where he supernaturally was led out for the first time. Then he starts his second missionary journey that we know everything that he did about all the churches and all the ministers and all the healings, but it didn't start out supernatural. The first one started out supernaturally. The second one didn't start out supernatural. 
Look what it says in Acts chapter 15, verse 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren, brethren in every city where we've preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Now, Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark, but Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted between one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Sicilia and strengthening the churches. His Literally, his first missionary journey started supernaturally where a word from heaven dropped on him and said, it's time for you to go. His second missionary journey started with an argument. See, the way God leads you the first time is not necessarily the way God will lead you the second time. And understand point number two. Just because the start of your dream or your desire begins slow and rocky doesn't mean you'll have a crash landing. Just because it doesn't start good doesn't mean it's not God's will for your life. One of the great mistakes that we make is we try to follow the leading of the Lord by depending on circumstances to always be good. Well, I know it's God's will if they give me more money. I know it's God's will if everybody thinks it's good. I know it's God's will if this happens. I know it's God's will if this happens. I know God will want me to do this if this takes place. I know God's will, this will happen if so-and-so shows up at my house and tells me, thus saith the Lord, this is God's will. I know it's God's will if a bird will fly over my head. I know it's God. We're looking for circumstances to always confirm good circumstances to always confirm this is God's will. Understand, sometimes God's will doesn't start out wonderful. And just because it might start out rocky doesn't mean you're going to have a crash landing. Paul's first journey started out with a supernatural word from God. His second journey started out with an argument and him and his best buddy parted ways. He and his best buddy parted ways. That's how his second missionary journey started out. But it was still God. It was still God. Number one, how the Lord leads you one time is not necessarily the way the Lord will lead you the next time. Number two, just because the start of God's plan for your life begins slow and rocky doesn't mean you'll have a crash landing. And then number three, not knowing where you're going doesn't mean you're going nowhere. Not knowing where you're going doesn't mean you're going nowhere. Amanda and I love to get out and drive. That's our, that's, the older you get, the less activity you need to do to have entertainment. On Memorial Day weekend, when we were younger, we'd have to go to the lake, we'd have to ski, we'd have to cook out, we'd have to boat, we'd have to enter tube. And you know how it is. When Memorial Day's over, you're wore out, you're skin up, you're sore, you can't move. Now that we've gotten our 60s, what are you going to do on Memorial Day? We're going to get in our car and we're going to ride around. Where are you going to go? I don't know, but we're going somewhere. See, not knowing where you're going doesn't mean... You're going nowhere. Understand that. Look at Acts chapter 16, verse 7. Acts chapter 16, verse number 7. We're on his missionary journey where great things took place. His second missionary journey. Notice what it says. Acts 16, verse 7. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden. Notice this. They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Verse 7, after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Now, understand this. This is his second missionary journey. He's already lost his partner who was with him on his first one. They got in an argument, but they knew this was God's will for them to go a second time. And now they start out. He's on a 500-mile walk. I struggle going around the Hooper Evelyn Center twice. They're on a... 500 mile walk and he's checking on these churches that he established during his first missionary journey. He crosses Turkey. 
And he heads into Ephesus. And look what it says in Acts 16, verse 6. Acts 16, verse 6. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden of the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. So Paul and Silas are heading in a certain direction, and the Spirit of God says, no, don't go that way. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how God communicated the no to Paul. We don't know if he had a vision. We don't know if he just had an uneasy feeling on the inside. We don't know if a prophet came up to him and told him not to do it. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But Paul was mature enough to know God doesn't want us to do this. Now, listen to me. God's no doesn't mean God's rejection. God's no usually means God's protection. If you're doing something and all of a sudden you know in your heart this is what God wants me to do and you get a no, finally something just doesn't work out and you, don't have, you have that uneasy feeling and you know this, maybe this is not the direction, that doesn't mean God's rejecting you. It means God's protecting you. Paul didn't take this no from the Spirit of God. He's 500 miles away from home. He don't take this no and say, well, I missed it. Let's just go back home. He didn't take it as God's rejection. He takes it as God's protection. And notice verse 7. So you know what he did? After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So he's going to Galatia, and he's headed out, and all of a sudden the Spirit says no. He didn't feel rejected. He didn't feel like he wanted to quit. Well, it ain't working out. I'm just going to quit. You know what he did? He said, well, he don't want to go this direction. Let's go this direction. So he turned to go somewhere else, and he gets to that place, and the Spirit said no. You don't go there. Now, by this time, he has walked 1,450 miles. And they come to the sea and can go no further. And young missionary protege, Timothy, is with him. And I'm sure the conversation went something like this. Brother Paul, it's such an honor to do ministry with you. My mother and my grandmother told me how great you were and all the wonderful things you do. And I've been looking forward to seeing some of those things. But you know, we keep walking around in circles. Do you have, and I'm 1,450 miles away from home. Do you have any idea where we're going? And I'm sure Paul looked at him and said, I don't have a clue. I don't have a clue. Now, remember, Paul had already had problems with another associate intern named John Mark and kicked him out. And now Timothy's asking these questions. Just because Paul didn't know the exact destination, it didn't stop him from trying to pursue the plan and purpose of God. Some of you have had something stirring in you for years. Some of you know, some of you know that you're born for more than you're doing. And you might not know where it's at, but you don't sit still with that. You keep moving. Years ago, I'd only come to, I came to Trinity. Amanda and I came to Trinity in all good, 1983. Trinity was 30 people and way behind on their payments. And it was bad. Banker used to call me every week. And I, I, we, we didn't know nothing. I was 25, Amanda was 22. We didn't know nothing about pastoring. We just knew we was trying to follow God. God opened this door and we're going to go. And uh, I'm out visiting All Good now. All Good's a wonderful place. It's, it's, the, it's wonderful. I love All Good. But when I went in 1983, it wasn't that great a place. They didn't have a Walmart. And they didn't have an Hispanic restaurant. And they didn't have a Chinese restaurant. And they didn't have a Zaxby's. And they didn't have a McDonald's. They had one gas station. They had two pumps. And one of them was empty most of the time. They had one little market. The all-good market, that's all they had, and they had a little dry cleaners. They had a city hall that was on septic tank. That's how, that's how backwards all-good was. So I was just out trying to find, meet some people. And I went to the little gas station, and there was a bunch of men stand, sitting in the, in the gas station. And there was this one fellow there, one fellow, and there, we'll forget him. And I went in, and they said, who are you? And I said, well, I'm the new pastor here at Trinity, all the little church there on the hole. I said, yeah. I said, I'm the pastor at the church in the hole. And they, because it used to flood every time because it was built real low. And, uh, And I just talked to them, and I just 
how y'all doing, introduce myself. As I was walking out, this one fella says to me, hey, preacher, I said, yes, sir. He said, would you pray for me a job? I said, well, well I, sure, man. I felt honored that he asked me. I'll be happy to pray for you a job. I said, how long have you been looking for a job? He said, for eight years. Now, I'm 25. I don't know a lot, but I know if you're looking for a job, it doesn't take God eight years to get you a job. <laughs> See, a lot of people know they need to be doing something, but they're at home waiting for God to do it. Paul's not at home, sitting at home saying, well, if he wants me to go, somebody will come by and Uber me where I need to go. No, he says, he starts to go here, and the Spirit says no. So he takes that, not his rejection, but his protection. He starts to go here, and the Spirit says no. He doesn't give up and quit. You know what he does? He comes to the end of his journey. He has nowhere else to go, and that's when the Spirit of God appears to him, a vision, and he sees this man from Macedonia, a vision of a guy from Macedonia saying, come over here and help us. So finally, he knows exactly where he's supposed to go. And that brings me to point four. Point one was this. How the Lord leads you one time is not necessarily the way the Lord will lead you every time. Point two, just because the start of your dream or your desire starts out rocky and slow doesn't mean you'll have a crash landing. Number three, not knowing where you're going doesn't mean you're going nowhere. And number four, being knocked down doesn't mean you're knocked out. Acts 16, verse number 8. Acts 16, verse 8. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, a man of Macedonia, stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to him. So they take off to Macedonia. We pick it up in verse number 11 of Acts 16. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. So they get there. And we were staying in that city for some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Notice he has a vision of a man from Macedonia saying, come over here and help us. So he heads that way. And notice the first people he meets in Macedonia is not a man. It's a women's prayer meeting. Now listen, you want to get caught up for a long time? Just join a women's prayer meeting. They'll pray everything in you and out of you all in one 12-hour session. Okay. He don't find a man, he finds a women's prayer meeting. Verse 14, now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira. I love that name of that city, Thyatira, who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. So all of a sudden, he's trying, he's 1,450 miles away from home. He tries to go here. The Spirit says no. He tries to go there the spirit says no he knows he's called he knows God sent him he knows he's on a divine assignment but nothing's opening up and suddenly he has this supernatural vision where the spirit of God says okay a man from Macedonia wants you to come over and preach to us he says that's God let's go so he takes off to Macedonia and he runs the he don't find a man he finds a group of women and in that group of men that he finds a business woman he hadn't found a man yet and I'm sure Timothy's looking at him saying, I thought you said we was going to see a man. We haven't got to a man yet. We haven't got to a man yet. So he preaches to this woman. He preaches to this woman. Verse 16, Acts 16, verse 16. 
Now, as it happened as he went to prayer, that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought us masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaimed to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. Paul, annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. He came out that very hour. But when our masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authority. I thought you said God sent us over here. God sent us over here. A man said, come over and help us. We hadn't found a man yet. We found a prayer meeting of women. Then we find a woman in the prayer meeting. She asked us to come to her house. As we're going to her house, we find a demon-possessed woman. I've met her seven times. We find a demon-possessed woman. We cast the demon out of her, and now we're going to end up in prison. And you said this is God's will? And we haven't found a man yet. We haven't found a man yet. Verse 20, and they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans to receive or observe. Verse 22, then the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. They're 1,450 miles away from home and now they take their clothes and they beat them up. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding that the jailer to keep them securely, having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Paul's first missionary journey in Acts 13 started with supernatural visitation from heaven. His second missionary journey starts in an argument, and he loses a friend but he knows it's God's will for him to go. He takes off. The first place he goes to, the Spirit says, don't preach here. The second place he goes to, the Spirit says, don't preach here. Finally, he sees a vision. And this man says, come over here in Macedonia and preach to us. So Paul says, that's it. That's where God wants us to go. That's why he called us. That's why he sent us. They head out and they don't find a man. They find a group of women. They preach to that group of women. Then they find a businesswoman. They preach to that businesswoman. And then all of a sudden, they cast the demon out of this woman. And her masters got mad at them, and they beat them up and threw them in prison. And they're just following the plan and purpose of God. Sometimes the will and purposes of God don't always go wonderful. But it doesn't make God's plan any less important or true. And some of you who are sitting here this morning in our campuses or here today, you started out what you knew was God's will for your life. But it turned sour on you. And you just thought, well, if it turned sour, I must have missed it somewhere. And you gave up on your dream. You gave up on your desire. But I want you to know that's not necessarily true. He ends up in prison. Now, let's finish this up with this. Look at Acts chapter 16, verse 25, because the fourth point is this. Being knocked down doesn't mean you're knocked out. Acts 16, 25. But at midnight, in Paul, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake that the foundation of the prisons were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loose. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and is about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm for we are all here. Verse 29. Then he called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31. And Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved in your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes. Immediately he and all of his family were baptized. Now he had brought them into his house. He set food before him and he rejoiced, having believed in God with his entire household. A man from Macedonia says, come over here and help us. Paul says, that's the will of God. 
That's what we've been looking for. Let's go. He starts out. He don't find a man. He finds a group of women. He ministers to them. And then in that group of women, there's a businesswoman. He ministers to her. And then as he's ministering, he, they cast a the devil out of a demon-possessed girl who's being trafficked, who's being trafficked. And Paul and Silas do something very wonderful. They get her free. And because they got her free, they're thrown in prison and they're beat up. There's a man from Macedonia. Come help us. Where did they finally meet the man? In prison. In prison. And they get the prisoner, the head of the prison, saved, his whole family saved. And then we start reading about all the churches that got established, all the ministers that got launched, all the healings that took place, and all the wonderful things that happened in the end of the book of Acts. But he had to go through hell to find God's will for his life. See, some of you, you know God's called you to do something. He's put something in your heart. It's been stirring for years. And now it's start, maybe some things have started to open up. Or maybe you launched out on your own and it just didn't work out. And you've set that dream on a shelf. It's time to pick it back up. 